Dear friends, today I will be talking to you about Telugu, a language which you may have heard of but you won't know much about because it is a South Indian language, one of the four major South Indian languages actually and I will just give you an overview of what happened in Telugu literature from the 11th century up to the present day. Uh, what are the transformations, what are the developments, what are the main features of Telugu language during all these 1500 years nearly. So, uh, I would like to start off saying that though it is one of the South Indian languages, it is only Telugu which has been called the Italian of the East. This is because of the melodious quality of the language. It has been hailed as the sweetest language by poets even other than Telugu, not just Telugu people but for instance a Tamil poet. Subramanya Bharati was referring to Telugu as the sweetest language in India. So, this Telugu has been uh, appreciated and admired by most of our contemporaries, our erstwhile people. So many pundits and scholars have been in favor of this language. And actually, you know Andhra Pradesh. Andhra Pradesh is a South Indian state and Telugu is the main language of Andhra Pradesh. It is being spoken by 80 million people already in Andhra Pradesh and apart from that, 70 million people in other states of India and in other countries also speak Telugu. Other than Andhra Pradesh, if I have to mention a few states, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Orissa, all these are neighboring states to Andhra Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh too. And if you think of countries other than India or our Andhra Pradesh, Malaysia, South Africa, Mauritius, America, England and France, all these countries, there are lots of people who speak Telugu. Telugu belongs to the Dravidian language family. You may have heard of it because in the whole of India, there are four language families. These are called Indo-Aryan is one, Dravidian another, Austro-Asiatic is the third one and Tibeto-Burman is the fourth one. And Dravidian language family consists of approximately 24 languages. Of these 24 languages, Telugu is the maximum spoken language. In fact, after Hindi in the whole of India, Telugu occupies the second place in the number of people who speak the language. Telugu is a vowel ending language. I just now said that it is very melodious and people call it the Italian of the East. Why do they call it the Italian of the East? It is because Telugu is a vowel ending language which means that each word in Telugu even if there is a word borrowed from other languages say from English or French or Bengali or Hindi, Telugu adds a vowel at the end of the language. That's the reason what becomes is it becomes more or less suitable for composing music. It becomes a lyrical language. It is this lyrical quality inherent in the language itself that makes Telugu such a melodious language and also that is why South Indian Carnatic music is predominantly in Telugu. As I was saying, who said Telugu is the Italian of the East? It wasn't anybody in India. It wasn't a Telugu person who said it. It was an Italian scholar, Nikolai Conti who said, who called Telugu Italian of the East because Italian, you may know, among the European languages, Italian is the most melodious language suitable for music and Telugu has a similar quality. And even the great emperor Sri Krishna Devaraya who ruled Vijayanagara including Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh, he said Telugu is the greatest language among the languages of this nation. The state of Andhra Pradesh is spread over 277,000 square kilometers. You see, when I say that Telugu language is born in Andhra Pradesh, you would like to know. I also said that Telugu language is spoken by majority of people, which means that it has a vast area. And so, it is spread over 277,000 square kilometers. And Telugu language itself has three major regional dialects. Among the Telugu speaking people, there are three types of people. These are coastal regions, Telangana region and Rail Sima. Apart from regional dialects, there are also social dialects but very few of them have script or written literature. And when it comes to script, Telugu script is like any other Indian script. It's syllabic. It has originated from Brahmi script. Telugu alphabet is also arranged on phonetic lines. And now I would like to talk to you about the history of Telugu literature. I said earlier this language has a history of 1500 years. And the most recent accomplishment of this language has been it has been accorded the status of classical language by the government of India, which had hitherto accorded the status only to two languages, Sanskrit and Tamil. And now, Telugu and Kannada are also referred to as classical languages, which means it is a very old language and also it is a very special and exclusive language. But if you talk about the history of Telugu written literature, 
I mean, orally, Telugu has been in vogue since 1500 years, as I said earlier. But if you are talking about written literature, it starts from the 6th century AD. Though Telugu words did appear even during before Christ areas in uh, Prakrit text, the proper Telugu text appeared in the 6th century inscriptions by the kings Renati Cholas. Telugu, though it belongs to the original Dravidian linguistic family, slowly started imbibing words from Prakrit and Sanskrit. So what happened was while the Dravidian languages had their own form, their own words, Telugu slowly got influenced by Prakrit and Sanskrit and so mixing all those words into its Dravidian component, it has created a very original form. So during the reign of the very first Telugu rulers, uh, what I would call the Shatavahana families, uh, during their reign you see that Telugu has appeared in most of the inscriptions. So mostly the Shatavahana kings have started promoting Telugu as a local language and then slowly it became a literary language and these Shatavahanas were ruling Telugu area in the first century AD. So Telugu words appeared as part of a Prakrit text, uh, text earlier. Later from the fourth century onwards, Sanskrit took over the place of Prakrit by the kings and this ultimately resulted in a highly Sanskritized poetic work being born in the 11th century. So when I am talking about Telugu as a world language, it appeared in the inscriptions, it appeared in other kavyas, Prakrit and Sanskrit texts here and there. But if you want a complete comprehensive Telugu text, literary text, you will have to come to the 11th century. So the very first classical Telugu poet was Nannaya whom we call Adikavi. He gave this language a completely literary form using Sanskrit words and expressions wherever appropriate and even retaining the original Telugu words wherever they were appropriate. So if you want to know about this language, I mean how many syllables has it, what is the uh, form of this language, you have 56 syllables, the first 16 being called vowels or atsulu as we call it in Telugu and the next, the rest are called consonants halulu. So in the present age what happened was as the um, things change people change and the usage changes and the way people talk, pe people write, everything keeps changing as you all know as age progresses. There are lots of changes in language and literature too. So pres in the present age actually a few of these letters are no longer in use but still they are taught in schools because you have to know what your language is all about. You ought to know what your original language was so they are actually preserved in schools to retain the complete original form of the language. And once I have given you the basic overview of how Telugu was born and what are the main features of language, now I think we can go over to the Telugu literature. Telugu literature has been written, I mean the history of Telugu literature has been written by many people in many forms, from many angles. But the basic angles were, the first one is the royal dynasties, I mean who ruled, who were the kings who ruled when a particular Telugu text has been written, whether they had any influence on the Telugu text, whether they probed into the Telugu writing. So that is what the royal dynasties have done. In fact, they have patronized a lot of Telugu texts. So that has that is one angle of looking at it. The second one is the major poets. So in each age, whatever the language, could be Hindi, English, Telugu, Kannada, any language, there are a few poets who occupy the major place. You see, it is through them that we know of that particular century, that particular age. So that age is known as that poet's age. Like you keep saying Kabir's age. So you keep saying Tagore sage. So similarly, uh, owing to the great contribution of one or two major poets, uh, there is the history of the literature is written. So that is the second one. The third one is the major genres. A genre is a literary form. If I say Kavya, Kavya is one literary form, Purana is another literary form, a novel is one, a poem is one, an essay is one. These are all major genres in literature. So in a particular age, one genre predominantly occurs over telling other genres. So the other genres are less important and one genre occupies the main place. So according to the genres also, the Telugu literary history has been written. Supposing in the 11th century, it was the Itihasa which was ruling. Later it was the Purana, then came the Kavya, then came the Prabandha. So according to the genre which was written by most poets of that particular period, the literary history is also described. So these are the three things, the royal dynasties, the major poets and the major genres. This is a three way, three pronged literary history of Telugu. So from the eastern Chalukya king Raja Raja Narendra, I was just now saying that do kings patronize literature, they do, they did, 
in fact because of the kings that we have very many many good poets coming into the fore and many many great texts being written and so eastern chalukyas were the first people to encourage telugu literature telugu language so it started off with them that was in the 11th century and up to raghunath nayaka the tanjavur king in the 18th century the patronage of kings with literary taste and generosity towards poets has encouraged the creation of great texts in telugu the dynasties which patronized telugu literature and even asked the poets to create a specific text i mean these dynasties they were not as if they liked whatever their poets wrote and then commended them or felicitated them uh, gave them a lot of money it's not only that they themselves asked their poets to write a specific text because that was the need of the hour that was necessary at that point of time for their people so eastern chalukyas come first in this so the major text born in this age was the translation of the mahabharata you are, everybody knows that mahabharata was written by vyasa rishi uh, in sanskrit and this has been translated into all indian languages including telugu and for telugu this was the first literary text secondly when we go to the when we talk only about the major kings the reddy kings we call them the reddy kings because it was a reddy clan which ruled over a certain part of andhra pradesh and during these uh, writers the, these kings the major texts which were written were again mahabharata continuation of mahabharata kashi khandam bhimeshwara puranam and lots of other texts mostly puranas and then we have the vijayanagara kings that is from the 15th century so krishna devaraya of this dynasty he himself was a very great poet and scholar krishna devaraya was not just a king he himself wrote a beautiful poem called amukta malyada it's what a vaishnavite poem and during his age we have the very very famous popular known poets called ashtadiggajas in telugu there were eight court poets the way navaratnas were there in rajasthan kingdom similarly you have ashtadiggajas in telugu and they created beautiful poetry and the tanjavur kings came later during the 17th and 18th centuries in this age again we have kings like raghunath nayaka whom i have already mentioned to you he himself was a very great poet and he patronized a lot of poets also the best thing best part of the tanjore kings or raghunath nayaka uh, patronizing poetry was that more number of women poets appeared during his tenure than in any other age for the first time women took to writing poetry during the 18th century so according to the kings it was the eastern chalukyas then the reddies then the vijayanagara and then the tanjavur kings these were the four main kingly patronages for telugu literature then i said it's not just kings it's also major poets so certain ages you identify with a certain poet because this poet epitomizes what all happened during that particular age and he created a literature which was followed upon imitated by others he inspired other poets when we talk about this who are the poets who come to our mind regarding telugu major writers as i said the adikavi nannaya then tikkana srinatha peddana and up to the present day poets each age had a very good poet to represent that particular area again the third one i said it can also be understood through the major genres because i'll go back to the poets later because i'll be talking about the particular text i'll go back to that area and now i'll just dwell upon slightly on the major genres also genres as i already told you are literary forms so after the kings you can look at telugu history through the kings you can look at telugu literary history through the poets again you can look at telugu literary history through, through the major forms like itihasa mahabharata was an itihasa so through itihasa purana kavya prabandha and all the modern genres when you come to the modern age modern genres are novel short story poetry um, uh, essay biography autobiography all these are modern literary forms so you can look at telugu literary history through these forms also so but division is not mutually exclusive so what i want to say is you just don't read one king and understand what happened during his age or read about one poet and understand what happened to telugu literature during his uh, tenure no you combine all of this they are not mutually exclusive you can combine them and read the literary history of telugu with all these three together the genre the poet and the king you can read them together that's how we can understand telugu poetry best so after this overview i would like to talk about the specificities of telugu literature which means each phase as i said telugu literature has many phases and the first phase would be 11th to 14th century it started with the translation of the vyasa bharata as i claimed earlier 
three poets spanning three centuries translated the complete mahabharata vyasa's mahabharata of 18 parvas they translated the complete text into telugu these three poets were nannaya tikkana and errana nannaya the very first poet in telugu is obviously called the adikavi he translated the first two and a half parvas of mahabharata the adi sabha and half of aranya parva after his death Somehow no other poet, I mean his own contemporaries did not take up the continuation of Mahabharata until Tikkana in the 13th century appeared. Once Tikkana appeared, he took up uh, Nanaya's work but then he also did not complete the part left out by Nanaya in the Aranya Parva. He left the Aranya Parva totally and he continued from the fourth one that is the Virata Parva and completed the 18 parvas, parvas of Mahabharata. Again in the 14th century, after Tikkana, Erana was the third poet who came onto the scene and he took up the part left out by Tikkana and also left out by Nanaya because of his death and he completed Aranya Parva. Thus, these three poets who brought into Telugu the entire Mahabharata are called Kavitrayam in Telugu, the poet trinity. Kavitrayam obviously three is, Trayam is three in Sanskrit also, that is how it is pronounced in Telugu also. So, the poet trinity of Telugu are Nannaya, Tikkana and Erana. They are hailed as the greatest poets of classical literature in Telugu. And the most interesting thing about Telugu Mahabharata is that when I call it a translation of Vyasa's Mahabharata, I do not exactly mean a translation because these three poets did not translate Sanskrit text verbatim into Telugu. Theirs was a very creative translation. In fact, it's often we mention it whenever we talk about Telugu Mahabharata, we call it a trans creation rather than a translation. So, what, do, what did these poets do? Why don't we call it a translation? Why should we call it a trans creation? That is a big question. It is because they made changes in the text. They omitted scenes and descriptions which they thought were detrimental to the reader's interest in the story. Or sometimes they, these things which Vyasa said were not consistent with the supposed characters. So, what did these th three Telugu poets do? They did not simply blindly translate the Sanskrit text into Telugu, but they thought about it in Sanskrit text, they thought about it from their own point of view and made changes wherever necessary. In fact, there is one particular incident, especially the Bhagavad Gita. Anybody who knows about India knows about Bhagavad Gita. So, this Bhagavad Gita appears in Mahabharata during the war. And during the war, it is Krishna who talks about Maha, he gives the whole Gita to Arjuna because Arjuna is afraid of continuing the war because he has to kill his own people during the war. So, and Krishna is reminding Arjuna of his duty as a warrior, as a Kshatriya, as just a human being fighting against Adharma. So, what happens in the original Vyasa Bharata is it is a very long, drawn out, long poem, Gita. But Tikkana, who translated it into Telugu, realized that this is where the story is becoming more and more interesting. It is a war. A war is being performed there. And people, readers who are reading the story would love to know what is happening next in the war. And they do not want a very, what I would call a Lamba Choda thing in uh, supposing to be a message. And such a big Gita in between the story, somehow Tikkana did not find it correct. So, what he did was he reduced the whole of the essence of the Bhagavad Gita to 40 poems. So, this is where Telugu poets while translating Mahabharata have used their own originality, their own judgment and saw to it that the text, the quality of the text was embellished and not destroyed. So, and when we talk about Nanaya, to this day I think there are poets in Telugu who follow the Nanaya style, others who follow the Tikkana style. These people were, belong to 11th and 13th centuries, but still even now Telugu poets love to say that they like Nanaya because his is the style they would like to uh, follow up, they would like to imitate. That is because Nanaya was known for his extraordinary command of the language and the felicity of expression and narrative skills. The way Nanaya told a story, he used to tell a story with, which was so interesting and also his expression were also very easy to understand. It was not a complex uh, description at all. It was very easy to understand and he used the Sanskritized Telugu very beautifully. And the second point Tikkana is actually now much more followed than Nanaya. And Tikkana is known for showing the story rather than telling it. You see actually now in the 20th century we have theories of literature which say you have to show a story not tell it. 
యాక్చువల్లీ ఇన్ తెలుగు తిక్కన షోడ్ దట్ పర్టికులర్ పాత్ ఆఫ్ నెరటివ్నెస్ ఇన్ థర్టీన్ సెంచురీ ఇట్ సెల్ఫ్ he told he never told the story he showed the story so his creativity lay in dramatics tikana himself personally he was extremely knowledgeable in many fields he knew what drama dance war tactics philosophy because he was a minister in a king's kingdom he knew all about war and when in kurukshetra he had to describe war obviously it came from his own experience it was not just translating vyasa's mahabharata he had his own experience of spending a lot of time during the war time so he knew the war tactics of different kings so he included that in his text and he was extremely philosophical and even politics he jabbed his in politics too and all this make his translation an outstanding one and the third poet erana he was a very exclusive poem a very special poet because he imbibed the qualities of both his predecessors and it is often said by critics that in the short part he translated he translated only, only uh, the half of aranya parva he started off in the style of nannaya whom he followed and ended up in the style of tikkana whose work he preceded so mm-hmm. thus the translated mahabharata is not only the first major kavya or itihasam but it is considered the greatest book ever written in telugu to this day there is a saying in Tel- among telugu folk that the only story worth listening to is the mahabharata if i want if you have to say it in telugu i would say vinte mahabharatam vinali so you have to listen only to mahabharata you don't need to listen to any other story that's enough for you it com- combines all stories in the world so there are various theories about why the first telugu poet chose to translate mahabharat a later work by vyasa rather than the first sanskrit kavya of valmiki the ramayana see most people know that everybody knows that uh, ramayana is the first indian text written valmiki is the adikavi of indian literature and w- how come the telugu people chose bharatam over ramayanam to translate there must be a reason and it was more or less a political and a religious reason so when you are talking about a literature i think it's necessary to remember the history of that those times especially the political and religious history of those times because without those things you won't be able to put this literature into a perspective it is said that mahabharata was meant to revive the greatness of the hindu religion at that time referred to as the religion based on the vedas because it was being i mean the whole of that area was being threatened by buddhists and jains mahabharata deals with all aspects of life and without being explicit it still gives all the knowledge of the vedas and upanishads which contain the essence of hinduism that is why rajaraja narendra of the eastern chalukya dynasty requested his court poet nannaya to translate mahabharata rather than any other sanskrit text in fact most of the telugu poets wrote kavyas on the behest of their kings starting from nannaya so mahabharata was meant to revive is some sort of a revival of hinduism or vaidik vaidik rituals and belief in vaidik hinduism that was main purpose of translating mahabharata over and above ramayana ramayana because it was just a kavya mahabharata had all the ingredients of what the upanishads and vedas says so that's how mahabharata came into being for the telugus as the very first written literary text so starting with nanaya most of the telugu poets we know wrote kavyas on the behest of their kings because kings of those days whatever the dynasty they believed that literature is the sort of medium which would enhance the quality of life of their people and impart knowledge of all kinds so here i think most of the rulers of erstwhile kingdoms i mean these kings are much better than what we have today if i mean in the present education system we don't have people believing that literature is a medium which can change people which can give us better values but this is what literature used to do in earlier days literature was meant to do it was supposed to do because nannaya called his kavyam vishvasreya kavyam so it, ha- it has to go f- do something good to the whole world that is the purpose of literature because of that the kings were encouraging poets to write and write and this poetry read by read or heard by their own people their own uh, uh, masses and that would not only impart knowledge of all kinds it would also teach them the good values the dharma and adharma of life so that is the reason our old age kings used to patronize court poets and make them write literary texts of excellence so where mahabharata is concerned it was doubly true because this epic considered the greatest in world literature has all forms of knowledge and also mahabharata in telugu is written in champu style 
what is the champu style which is very particular to telugu literature and uh, malayalam literature these two literatures in south india have this champu style which means a combination of poetry and prose so while the major part of the work is in poetry in between there are passages of prose which contain a connecting sentences or exclusive descriptions to the main narrative so this champu form initiated by nanaya was followed by all the major poets of telugu literature and here it's very important you see when i am talking about kings i am talking about the way kings have been encouraging poetry giving away uh, lots of money to poets or making poets write for themselves at the same time there was another tradition going on i am talking about the classical tradition where poets as court poets were writing poetry but simultaneously there was another desi tradition going on in telugu literature which is a very important aspect so this is called the marga tradition and the desi tradition in fact this is also true of kannada literature so when i say marga literature it is the language and form based on sanskrit while desi is exclusively indigenous that is the form and language used by the ordinary man the masses both these types of literature received huge success in telugu that is the greatness of telugu readers and telugu people that at the same time simultaneously both the marga tradition which was more or less an imitation of the sanskrit old age sanskrit texts and at the same time the desi tradition which grew from the experience of the people from the masses both have been received for what they are worth both have been recognized and both have been admired well mahabharata belong to the marga tradition poetry created by the veera seva poets of the 12th and 13th centuries in telugu literature were an offshoot of the desi tradition the meter the language the stories narrated all in these kavyas were from native experience indigenous and among them palkuriki somanatha was an excellent poet his kavya basava puranam is a masterpiece for the desi tradition when i said mahabharata is a masterpiece in marga tradition it is basava puranam by palkuriki somanatha in the desi tradition with its dvipada meter and shaivite narratives dvipada is a telugu meter totally till then mahabharata was using all the meters uh, that are uh, pre- prevalent already in sanskrit sanskrit but palkuriki somanatha brought about dvipada a telugu meter grown from the telugu folk folk narratives that sort of a meter to telugu and made it a classic so it was in essence the influence of the neighboring kannada speaking areas that veera shaivism and the desi tradition both of them took roots in the telugu speaking belt this resulted in the writings of the great trio in telugu of veera shaivism pandita aradhya mallikarjuna palkuriki somana and nanna choda among them palkuriki somana who lived in the 12th century was hailed as the greatest with at least a dozen works to his credit nanna choda's kumara sambhavam was a kavya in the marga tradition though the content boasted of desi characteristics but i think the person you have to read or you have to know about is palkuriki somana he went against nanaya and he brought poetry closer to the masses with his very simple form very simple style language and storytelling methods the shaiva poets did not write to please the king i think this is where the main difference between the mahabharat poets and the veera shaiva poets stand upon because mahabharata was uh, written because nanaya was asked by the king to write it but the shaiva poets did not write to please any king but they wrote to spread the message of lord shiva to the masses so the shivakavi age which is what we refer to in telugu literature during the 12th 13th centuries is an age where literature imbibed the common man's agony in his prayer to the lord for instance the characters in the narratives of basava puranam i was just mentioning it as the best text of palkuriki somanatha they were all not kings they were not gods and goddesses they were not abnormal human beings they were very normal human beings they were neither kings nor deities their reaction to god and description of lord shiva is extremely natural and down to earth for instance there is one character in basava puranam called bejja mahadevi she is a great devotee of lord shiva she exclaims that lord shiva behaved as he did only because he had no mother to look after him in a beautiful poem the poet says talli kaligina neela tapasiga nichu talli kaligina neela tala jadal gattu this is a beautiful poem in which in essence means if lord shiva had a mother she would not let him wander in the wasteland if lord shiva had a mother she would not allow him to wear snakes on his neck and if lord shiva had a mother she would not have allowed him to drink poison if lord shiva had a mother she would not have allowed him to become a wanderer 
see all these characteristics of shiva shiva everything describes lord shiva in a nutshell all these descriptions he wanders in a wasteland he wears a snake he drank a poison for the sake of the good of the deities and the devatas uh, to counter rakshasas all these things lord shiva has done and on the one hand he is describing all the great things that shiva has done on the other hand who is saying this one of his devotees an elderly woman who is wondering how come lord shiva could do all this if he had a mother that mother would not have allowed which means this lady is thinking like a mother she is not thinking like a devotee this is the natural and indigenous way of expressing the love for god that this common women had so this is the type of poetry that veera shaivism brought into telugu poetry here it is not the learned devotee speaking but just an ordinary mother of children wondering aloud this human touch is the great contribution of the shaivite poets to telugu classical literature this poets also wrote in the meter which was indigenous as i said earlier the dipada as against the sanskrit imitations of the poet trinity the kavitraya wrote in sanskrit uh, imitations but the shaiva poets wrote in telugu basic local um, dipada or local meter as i was saying by the 12th century itself simultaneously telugu readers had two streams of literary tradition the marga and the deshi the contemporary of palgurki and the follower of nannaya tikkana brought about a great meeting point of both the traditions in his translation of the greater part of mahabharata he combined both the marga and deshi traditions thereby attracting both scholars and commoners so this is what we know about the first earlier part of text and especially when we talk about tikkana we talk about the character of draupadi with all her gestures intonations and choice of words and whatever you see of draupadi being portrayed in modern day it i think in telugu literature it was tikkana who gave her that face now we come to the second phase of telugu literature 14th and 15th centuries which are embodied by two great very great poets potana and sinatha the 15th century saw the emergence of two of the greatest poets who but they were miles apart in their creative genius one was the highly charismatic sophisticated extrovert sinadha the second was the highly devotional exquisitely poetic introvert poet potana and the legend has it that they were close relatives but this cannot be corroborated because in when you are talking about such 5 600 years ago you don't know who is related to whom but in telugu history they keep saying that these two were very closely related be that as it may it is agreed that they were contemporaries and represented two divergent sensibilities of telugu literature that's why they both are very important for telugu people sinadha was a prolific writer and many of his writings are available till date from the reddy kings to the early vijayanagara kings sinadha received the patronage of many royal families and reveled in it he was a devotee of lord shiva and most of his works are taken from shiva puranas if i can mention a few they are kashi khandam bhimeshwar puranam haravilasam shivaratri mahatyam etc and sinadha brought a grandeur to telugu language which later became the hallmark of telugu poets his influence on later poets was so huge so it is no exaggeration to say that even modern poets even poets of today this century claim that they were influenced by sinadha and they are imitating him he was hailed as the kavi sarvabhouma potana is also known for his humble character he was asked by the king sarvajna singha bhopala to dedicate mahabharata to him but potana refused he he said that why you should i dedicate a book to a rascal like you i mean he called the king's rascals and he said the only person i am going to dedicate my book is to is lord rama because he seems to have become a devotee of uh, sri rama while he was actually a shaivite because sri rama asked him to write mahabharata there is a very famous poem in telugu పలికెడిది భాగవతమట పలికించెడు వాడు రామభద్రుండట నే పలికిన భవహరమగునట పలికెద వేరొండు గాథ పలుకగనేల వెన్ రామ హిమ్సెల్ఫ్ ఆస్ మీ టు ట్రాన్స్లేట్ భాగవత వై షుడ్ ఐ హెస్టేట్ సో హీ మూవ్ ఆన్ టు ట్రాన్స్లేట్ ఇట్ ఇన్ డెడికేటెడ్ ఇట్ టు లార్డ్ రామా బికాస్ హీ కన్సిడర్డ్ మార్టల్స్ ఎస్పెషలీ ది కింగ్స్ ఆస్ రాస్కెల్స్ అండ్ డిడ్ నాట్ థింక్ ఇట్ నెసరీ టు టు ప్లకేట్ దెమ్ ఆర్ ఎనీథింగ్ పోతనాస్ తెలుగు ఇస్ వెరీ వెరీ రిధమిక్ మందార మకరంద మాధుర్యమున తేలు మధుపంబు పోవునే మదనములకు నిర్మల మందాకిని వీచికల తూగు రాయంచ జనునే తరంగిణులకు దిస్ ఆర్ దిస్ ఇస్ ఫ్యూ లైన్స్ ఆఫ్ హిస్ పోయిట్రీ అండ్ దెన్ ది వే హీ యూజ్ ఎ సింగిల్ లెటర్ ది లెటర్ డ ది వే హీ యూజ్ ది తెలుగు ఐ మీన్ తెలుగు హ్యాస్ వెరీ ఎక్స్ ఎక్స్క్లూజివ్ వేస్ ఆఫ్ యూజింగ్ లాంగ్వేజ్ 
అడిగేదనని కడువడి జను అడిగిన తన మగడు నుడువడని నడయుడుగున్ వెడవెడ సిడిముడి తడబడ అడుగిడు నడుగిడదు జడిమ నడుగిడు నెడలన్ సో దిస్ ఇస్ ది టైప్ ఆఫ్ పొయిట్రీ పోతన క్రియేటెడ్ విచ్ షోడ్ అస్ హౌ మ్యూజికల్ తెలుగు కెన్ బి అండ్ దెన్ వి హ్యావ్ ఎ వెరీ ఎక్స్క్లూజివ్ పోయెట్ హూ మోస్ట్ ఆఫ్ యూ మస్ట్ హ్యావ్ హర్డ్ ఆఫ్ బికాస్ హిజ్ క్రితీస్ ఆర్ కిర్తనాస్ ఆర్ సంగ్ ఈవెన్ నౌ బై గ్రేట్ మ్యూజిషియన్స్ మ్యూజిక్ కంపోజర్స్ he is called annamacharya and he also was a contemporary to these two sinatha and potana annamacharya's writings are called pada kavita and on the one hand you have sinatha creating great poetry and then you have potana who imbibed sri vaishnavism and at the same time there there emerged a very unique genre that is called pada kavita and the poet composer was talapaka annamacharya and this pada kavita at a later age took the new and a more musically mature form of kirtana most of you must have heard of tyagaraja saint tyagaraja saint tyagaraja is whom we all consider the father of carnatic music and all the singers today south indian classical singers all sing only tyagaraja songs i mean they become popular only singing tyagaraja so and annamacharya was the influence on tyagaraja annamacharya was the first one to introduce this musical literature to telugu so it's essentially a musical genre but with excellent literary values annamacharya took vaishnavism to new heights preaching visishtadvaita in its purest form he is said to have written and composed more than 13000 songs but only a few hundreds are available now and his lord his god was the lord venkateshwara all of you know about tirumala hills the seven hills and lord venkateshwara over there and annamacharya sat there before the lord venkateshwara and sang most of his kirtis they were all spontaneously sung in front of this deity the literary excellence the combination of the marga and desi traditions and his expressions make the works of annamaya rare contribution at the same time the same 15th century saw the very first telugu women poet in literature none other than the wife of annamacharya and her name is talapaka timmakka so timmakka was the first women telugu poet in telugu literature and she was the contemporary of annamacharya in fact his wife and she wrote in a telugu meter and annamacharya is best known for his caste less poetry so when i talk about annamacharya i'm not just talking about his excellence in literary values or his musical knowledge but what i would like to say is he brought telugu literature to the masses by social reform he was the first poet in telugu to say there are no castes caste is nothing you should not go by the varnashrama in his kriti brahma mukkate para brahma mukkate he calls for the equality of the castes and calls for bhakti as the whole and soul of human existence which has no limitations of caste creed or class and then we come to the exclusive telugu genre of the 16th century and that is the prabandha i was mentioning krishna devaraya of the vijayanagara kingdom even earlier in my lecture and krishna devaraya was the person who made telugu literature's golden age during his tenure and in his period actually there was a woman poet atukuri molla whose rendition of ramayana has also made a mark in telugu literature but it was sri krishna devaraya who actually brought the what you call the golden age when you talk about golden ages of literary history you talk about generally the guptas in indian history similarly in telugu literature the golden age was sri krishna devaraya's reign Uh, during the 16th century and so krishna devaraya himself was a very great poet his uh, kavya amukta malyada is considered the greatest poem on vishishtadvaita in telugu and he was not only a celebrated king but he patronized eight major poets all these poets experimented in the language and literature with great innovation these 20 years of his rule are known as the most prolific period for telugu literature so most of them i'll just uh, name some of the f- uh, few of those poets and their works alasani peddana and his manucharitram pingali suranas kala purnodayam nandi timmanas parijata paharanam ramaraja bhushanas vasucharitram tanali ramakrishnas pandranga mahatyam dhurjati skala haste mahatyam are some of the classics and this is an age where earlier i was saying that veera shaivism and veera vaishnavism had some sort of a fight between them there was some uh, actually some sort of a fight not exactly a fight but some uh, kings patronized shaivism some kings patronized vaishnavism and so there was a disharmony but in during krishna devaraya's age both shaivism and vaishnavism coexisted in harmony 
Krishna Deva Rai himself was a Vaishnavite and his Amukta Malita was based on Alvar Goda Devi's devotion. At the same time, Dhurjati, his court poet, created a Kavya with Lord Shiva at its center. So this was an age truly sociologically, historically, even literature wise, this was an age which can be called the golden age of Telugu literature. And in the fourth phase, we come to an age where there was a setback because of political and historical conditions and there was no patronage or encouragement to poets. During this 17th century, the Tanjore kings, Tanjore is actually in Tamil Nadu, it is not a Telugu place, but the Tanjore kings were Telugu and they patronized Telugu poets. Especially the female poets of that period are extremely popular and to this day they are read. Rangajamma and Muddupadani are two of these female poets. And the king Raghunadhanayaka himself was a prolific pro, sorry. The king Raghunadhanayaka himself was a prolific writer. And the most important part of the, his age was that not only that women poets came into the fore, but also a very rare performing art like Yakshagana, which combined music performance, literature and dance and these four combinations of literary values and this was revived by Raghunath Naika himself. So this was a very important period for Telugus because on the one hand there was a degeneration and on the other hand there were new genres coming up, new type of poets coming up and one of the chief texts of this period, I was mentioning Muddupadani just now, Har Kavya Radhika Santvanam was banned during the Victorian age because it was an erotic Kavya. In fact, eroticism is a very important part of Telugu literature, especially from the 16th century onwards. Till then it was more devotional, but after 16th century, eroticism was a very important aspect of Telugu literature. But when the male poets were writing eroticism, it was very happily received. But when a female poet like Muddupadani wrote, it was objected to not by her contemporaries, but in the Victorian age. You know what, in, uh, during the Victorian age, British were banning most of our books and uh, Muddupadani's Radhika Santhanam was also actually banished. It was in controversy. Later, uh, it, the ban got lifted and it was accepted. So at this time, what happened was, while as I said, there was a degeneration in poetry, there were no patronages for poets, but then there were two very important poets of this period who brought literature to a totally different level. One of them was the 17th century Potuluri Veera Brahmendra Swami and another was the 18th century Vemana. So Potuluri Veera Brahmendra Swami is called the Nostradamus of Telugu, Andhra Pradesh because he predicted what is going to happen later in 21st century, 20th century. It seems most of the things are happening now. That's what his devotees keep telling us. He belonged to a backward caste but he created songs and poems of with great spiritual intensity and his predictions are still followed by his devotees. And after him emerged the great poet Vemana who we call, in Telugu he is called the first social reformer and also the first poet of the masses, what in Telugu we refer to as Praja Kavi. He is the most discussed poet and he has been a source of inspiration and imitation even to the present generation. He wrote in very simple Telugu using the Deshi meter Ataveladi and he was known for imparting great meaning through very simple words. His genre is called the Shataka. This again is an exclusive Telugu literary form where a poet writes a minimum of 100 poems with the last line being the same in all poems. The way you have in a ghazal, there is the name of the poet appears in the last line. Vemana's last line was Vishwadabhirama Vinura Vema. So it's only three line poem with a sea of meaning mostly criticism of the society and what's happening in contemporary age about the people and it's also a critique of social manners. So his capacity to use very simple similes to great effect and his penchant for satire earned him the epithet, the first modern poet of Telugu. I'll give one small example. Uppu kappurambu vokka polika nundu chooda chooda ruchula jada veru purushulandu punya purushulu veraya vishpadabhi rama vinura vema. The first two lines in this poem are about a specific thing, often poetic with a simile. The act verbatim the poem means salt and camphor look similar. You know camphor, camphor is used in the puja. Salt and camphor look similar, but closer observation shows their taste is different. Among men, virtuous people stand apart. So beloved of the bounteous Vema, listen. Just like all men look alike, but Purushottams are different. That's what he tried to say and look at the simile he chose. Salt and camphor, they both look alike, white 
very shiny, little shiny and both of them look similar but they taste different similarly all men look similar but the greater you only under close observation you will realize the purushottama a good person and a bad person so vemana's poems invariably have a message and that is the reason he has been followed by lots of modern poets too and shataka is uh, the particular genre which he has popularized and we have lots of shatakas um, after vemana and another person i was just mentioning musical literature when i was talking about annamacharya tyagaraja came after vemana during the end of 18th century and he happens to be the one person who has brought carnatic music to millions and billions and trillions of people all over the world he is one of the trinity of carnatic music and he is the quintessential source of classical music for the whole of south india not only south india we know that even john higgins from britain came and learned tyagaraja skrtis here Though he was born in Tiruvayur, a place in Tamil Nadu, he was a Telugu-speaking person, and all his kritis are in Telugu, barring a few in Sanskrit. The present-day Carnatic music owes its existence mostly to him. So, Tyagaraja Swami, is, as contribution to Telugu literature, has been very high in the sense that he brought literature and music together like nobody else has done before him. After him, there is in the end of 19th century, we have one revolutionary women poet called Tarigonda Venkamamba. she can be called a revolutionary because though she belonged to a traditional brahmin family she refused to shave her hair you know that is the common custom in brahmin families that if the husband dies the wife shaves her hair and tarugonda venkamamba in 19th century itself she defied her customs her family's customs and then she refused to shave her head and she was castigated by the community but not even bothering about them she dedicated her whole life to writing literature and lord venkateshwara was her subject and her kavyas are considered are as very important in the devotional literature while talking about literature in telugu we have to remember that as i said earlier telugu is a lyrical language and because it's a lyrical language it is very important in performing arts most of the telugu dances or other types of types of performing arts have literary values mainly because literature could not see it away apart from performing arts they were mingling all the time in 14th century we had one siddhendra yogi who created the kuchipudi dance most of you must have heard of kuchipudi dance it's a very popular art form and many people uh, even in the north are learning kuchipudi dance these days and this was created in the 14th century in krishna district of andhra pradesh and he immortalized the love story of lord sri krishna and satyabhama it wasn't just krishna and radha it was krishna and satyabhama whom this dance form immortalized This was the first time lyrics were specially written to suit dance. While this dance had love songs interspersed with devotional content, later songs by Kshetraya they contained mostly erotic matter. Nevertheless, dance literature is one of the most attractive and innovative of literature in Telugu. And then we have a beautiful form, Hari Katha. This art form of a later age combines literature, drama, and music, and it's only one person who performs all these arts. in kuchipudi at least you have a group of persons performing on the stage but in harikatha he is just a storyteller but he sings in between the story he enacts the role of his character supposing he is talking about rama and ravana he becomes rama he becomes ravana both these characters he plays he becomes also a critic at the same time he comments on the story evaluates it compares it to the modern day day's happenings and mostly harikatha tells the story of lord vishnu Adi Bhatta Narayan Dasu is the artist par excellence in this genre, and this is truly literary performing art in Telugu. And there is one Telugu literary art which is totally exclusive. No other language in India has this literary art, and it is called Avadhanam. This is a literary feat where one single scholar takes on a minimum of eight scholars and a maximum of a thousand scholars, and answers their queries in poems. the questions themselves are scholars and poets i mean if i am asking an avadhani a question i should be a scholar myself so within a few hours he creates hundreds of poems as answers to their questions none of these poems are sit, uh, written by sitting and formulating a poem the avadhani has to do everything extempore everything spontaneous so he has to be an extremely well read person because he doesn't know who is going to ask what i may ask any question ask him to say it in particular poem particular meter he is going to say it in that meter with, ex- with every technical uh, rule being followed so that makes avadhanam an exclusive art which has been perfected by the telugu people 
and uh, these days uh, we come to hear of some people in Uttar Pradesh actually um, trying to do this act, do this feat in Hindi. Then there is being an attempt, but it, the originator is Telugu language and it is going great guns in Telugu even now. And now I come to the last phase of Indian Telugu literature. And now I come to the last phase of Telugu literature and this is the modern age. When you talk about modernity in Telugu literature, I think in any literature for that matter, we have to remember two things. One could be chronological and other could be qualitative. So both in quality and chronology, historical chronology, it has to be modern. Uh, so the characteristic of the literature should also be modern, just not just the period. So late 19th century was a period of renaissance for nearly all Indian literatures and for Telugu too, it is the same. And so we can say that around 1860s, Telugu literature acquired modern characteristics. The main events which inspired this were the reformist movement started by Raja Ram Mohan Rai in Bengal, the establishment of printing press and the ensuing publications of Telugu books and especially the English education imparted at that time and availability of English literary texts. And then the teachings of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, the Arya Samaj and the Divyajnana Samaj or the Theosophical Society, all this mainly four reasons for modernity to emerge in Telugu. And the broadening of the thinking of the Telugu scholars can be said to have started with Kandukuri Vireshalingam Pantulu. He is generally acknowledged as the pioneer of modern literature. And he introduced most of the modern genres into Telugu. You, most of you know what modern genres are. Earlier we had Itihas and Kavyas and Prabandhas. Now we have novel, drama, one act play, satire, column writing, autobiography, biography, essay, journalistic writing. All these things have been introduced by Virachalingam. The content which he brought to Telugu literature was also very wide ranging and he had many followers in his own lifetime. His magnum opus is the novel of social manners called Rajasekara Charitram. Mainly he was talking about social reform which meant girl education, abolition of child marriages, remarriages of child widows and prohibition of prostitution. This was mainly what Kandukuri was aiming at and now after a long time. I have been talking about literature in Telugu which was mostly about kings, deities or mainly because it was devotional or talking about a uh, happily romantic story of uh, king and his uh, concubine or something like that. These were the themes earlier except for Mahabharata, the rest of the things were themes like this. But it is only with the modern age that you have the common man entering literature. Like in all Indian literatures, in Telugu too, there have been a few movements which decided the nature and content and also the expression, the form of literature. We can divide the modern movements into a few uh, ages. The nationalist movement was from 1920 to 1940s. The romantic movement was from 1915 to 1930. The progressive movement was from 1930 to 1950. And the Digambara poets movement was it is a short lived movement but very greatly effective 1964 to 67. And then the revolutionary movement from 1970 to 80 feminist movement 1980 onwards or we can say up to 2000, Dalit movement 1980 to 2000, regional literary movement 1990 onwards and minority movement which is mostly Muslim minority literary movement it is 1990 onwards. These movements basically decided the content of different genres. So when we go to romantic movement, so what did romantic movement mean? So most of you must be knowing of Wordsworth. Keats, Shelley, the major British romantic poets and these were the poets who influenced Telugu poets of that period. Rai Prol Subbarao, Devul Palikrishna Shastri, Nayana Subbarao, Nanduri Subbarao are some of the poets. What were the characteristics of this romantic movement? Worship of the lady love. But lady love was not just a physically um, beautiful woman like in the earlier Kavyas. It was more or less like a deity. Back to nature. Going back to nature was Wordsworth's call to literary people. Glorification of sorrow. Sorrow was considered not something that you should dispense with. It was something you should enjoy. That was one of the characteristics of this poetry. Subjectivity, alienation from society, lucidity in expression, lyrical poetry and short poems. So when we talk about uh, romantic poetry, the first person in Telugu that comes to our mind is invariably Devalupalli Krishna Shastri. His poetry has influenced people so long and so strongly that even today people are there who swoon over everything Krishna Shastri has written. For sheer lyricism, there is nobody to touch him. 
ఆకులో ఆకునై పువ్వులో పువ్వునై కొమ్మలో కొమ్మనై నునులేత రెమ్మనై ఈ అడవి దాగిపోనా ఎటులైనా ఇచ్చటనే ఆగిపోనా గణగణని వీచు చిరుగాలిలో కెరటమై గగలగలని పారు శెలవాటలో తేటినై పగడాల చిగురాకు తెరచాటు తేటినై పరువంపు విరిచేడి చిన్నారి సిగ్గునై ఐ మీన్ ఇఫ్ యూ కమ్స్ ఆర్ టు రిసైటింగ్ కృష్ణశాస్త్రి దెర్ విల్ బి నో ఎన్ టు ఇట్ బట్ దిస్ వాజ్ ఎ స్టైల్ హిజ్ యూసేజ్ ఆఫ్ తెలుగు as part of a lyric as influenced telugu people so much and this has proved that telugu is a really a very lyrical language and the, next came the progressive movement progressive movement was more or less a reaction to romantic movement because the romantics were always preoccupied with their lost loves and lamentations and this irritated the progressives they called all romantic poetry escapist self centered and of no use to society progressive movement was obviously the result of the telugu scholars acquaintance with the leftist ideology especially marxist ideology and this started in the 1930s and the master of this poetry is by far the greatest modern telugu poet sri sri he was srirangam srinivasarao referred to as sri sri his mahaprasthanam is rated the greatest work of modern poetry and he more or less gave us the marching song of the telugu people ఏ దేశ చరిత్ర చూసినా ఏమున్నది గర్వకారణం నరజాతి చరిత్ర సమస్తం పరపీడన పరాయణత్వం ధర్మజలానికి ధర్మజలానికి ఖరీదు కట్టే షరాబు లేడోయ్ నాలో కదిలే నవ్య కవిత్వం కార్మిక లోకపు కళ్యాణానికి శ్రామిక లోకపు సౌభాగ్యానికి పొలాలనన్నీ హలాల దున్ని ఇలా తలంలో హేమం పిండక కదం తొక్కుతూ పదం పాడుతూ హృదయ నేత్రం గర్జరిస్తూ పదండి పోదాం పదండి పోదాం పదండి పోదాం పై పైకి మరో ప్రపంచం మరో ప్రపంచం మరో ప్రపంచం పిలిచింది దిస్ వాజ్ ది సార్ట్ ఆఫ్ ఎసెన్స్ ఆఫ్ మార్క్సిజం దట్ శ్రీ శ్రీ బాట్ టు దిస్ ప్రోగ్రెసివ్ పొయిట్రీ విచ్ వాజ్ ఫాలోడ్ లేటర్ బై దాశరథి నారాయణ రెడ్డి ఆరుద్ర నారాయణ బాబు ఆల్ దిస్ పొయిట్స్ అండ్ దెన్ లేటర్ స్లోలీ ది ప్రోగ్రెసివ్ మూవ్మెంట్ ఆల్సో డిక్లైన్ అండ్ అప్ టు నైన్టీన్ సెవెంటీ you don't find really revolutionary poems in telugu literature till the revolutionary writers organization was born in 1971 it went a step ahead of progressive movement here the poets were expected to participate in the armed struggle earlier progressive poets were writing poetry but were they were happily having their own jobs but here they wanted the poets to also participate in the armed struggle which made them both activists and poets at the same time this created a new type of poetry in telugu Gaddar, Vangapandu Prasadarav, K.G. Satyamurthy or Shivasagar are some of the poets who took this struggle to far-flung rural areas and this is the time when Telugu poetry saw song come into existence in a big way. Song earlier was the devotional song but now song was something that actually instigates people to go for armed struggle. This is the sort of song the revolutionary movement brought to Telugu poetry. and from here we come to the latest to, um, the far most very very effective and currently uh, contemporary movements feminist and dalit revolutionary literary movement had a single agenda as most of you must have heard because it is a marxist based agenda it believed that marxist ideals and armed struggle were the answer to all questions and all problems this poetry spoke only about the class it disregarded gender and caste members of this revolutionary movement included educated women and educated dalits too so slowly these writers realized that their identity was being gobbled up in the process of eliminating class they argued that class was not the only point of division for society gender and caste also played a role in the inequalities since revolutionary organization did not give them scope to vent out their feelings these two groups gradually left it and they emerged as different identities thus we have the women leading the feminist literary movement and the dalits leading the dalit literary movement so here for the first time women were writing about their own predictions and whatever problems they had they were writing boldly and uh, they were writing about the self imposed and the society imposed censorship and they became very outspoken candid truthful and honest the major poets of this poetry are jayaprabha olga konnepuri nirmala rajini ghatasala nirmala etc etc one example of feminist poetry written by jayaprabha i can quote in english translation this poem is about the way men stare at women with no decency looks from two eyes dark like needles roam freely on flesh those eyes belong to a million classes but their looks are all the same on the road in buses classrooms behind your every step wounding some part of your body looks tipped with poison keep pricking you 
frightened i want to disappear into the distant sky escape is no solution so i began to teach my eyes the sharpness of thorns to fight those poison looks now to chase away those eyes i fight with my eyes timid eyes which cannot look straight for 2 seconds run to the underworld a day will come when women in this country have thorns not only in their eyes but all over their bodies so this is one example of the feminist poetry which has become very strong and very positive and uh, very authoritative too so these are the um, slowly these are the movements that have been actually came out from the social reform movement from the progressive movement from the revolutionary movement each section of the society is carving out a niche for himself in telugu right now so even in feminist poetry you have a minority women poetry you have a dalit feminist poetry so all these fragmentations what appear like fragmentations to us are actually the echoes of all the people who are suffering under a lot of social evils that are, are right now in our society so slowly the we can say that modern telugu poetry started off with reformist tendencies but ended up in search for identity and we also have to when you're talking about history of literature we also have to talk about the prose genres and when we talk about prose genres novel and drama and short story and essay are some of the prose genres which occupy a major part and among the prose works apart from kandukuri's novels i think there is one drama which stands very very tall stands tallest i would say and that is kanya shulkam bride price the english translation would be bride price of gurujada appara it is considered the best play ever in telugu in fact not only in telugu when you look at contemporary dramas of that period in all other indian languages he wrote it in 1897 when we look at uh, it, uh, the first plays modern plays of all other languages in india we see that the telugu play was far above them in its vision in its uh, format in its humor in its expression in its dialogues etc similarly at the time when nationalism was at its peak i am just mentioning a few of telugu milestone writings uh, the novel malapalli by unnava lakshmi narayana is one novel which stands above all other novels in indian literature not just telugu literature this was published first in 1921 but it can be called a visionary work by a writer of extraordinary perception in 1921 none of us including gandhi thought that india would get independence we are not too sure that we are going to get our independence but in this novel which was published in 92 22 or 23 the author has already said that india has gained its independence and also india got its independence only through non violent methods and not violent methods so this was a visionary at work and uh, unnava lakshmi narayan smalapalli stands as one of the greatest novels in indian literature and it being written in telugu is a um, some some sort of a very give us gives pride to the telugu people and when we talk about prose genres there are there is one more writer gudipati venkata chalam in telugu who again is one of his ilk there are hardly anybody to compare with him in indian literature because he was the first writer he started writing in 1928 and he was the first writer who took novel and short story to great heights and mainly because he wrote for the first time ab- about women's freedom the freedom of women was at the core of all his fiction and when he was writing this he actually for the first time talked about the sexual independence and sexuality of women which was extremely rare and it was not even accepted during those that ages but it was later accepted by most of the people and now the feminists are also following what chalam said in 1920s so chalam was more or less the first feminist in indian literature itself not just telugu and so after the 1950s if we go through all the prose genres of telugu we can come to a conclusion that, that there were a few types of uh, prose um, content there psychoanalytical marxist historical family relationships man woman relationships caste relations urbanization farmer struggle youth and love middle class mentality generation gap revolutionary struggle globalization consumerism all these were there in telugu prose genres and one thing of great pride for telugu fiction is in 1950s a story entitled galivana by palagumi padmaraju it means cyclone it won an international prize conducted by new new york herald tribune in 1952 it was selected amongst 59 stories from 23 countries and telugu people pride themselves on this prize there were many major writers in telugu who wrote about all and i mean there are lots of names we can give and uh, especially in prose genres 
women have been very very effective in writing novels and short stories and um, abburi chaya devi olga ranganayakamma jayaprabha all these are major writers in uh, telugu fiction and telugu poetry and while there are so many creative genres obviously there would be a lot of criticism too so because in unlike uh, uh, creative writing criticism requires a lot of scholarship and you need real scholars to do literary criticism luckily we had very good critics and criticism is necessary to keep up the standards of writing and so it happened that in telugu from 1900s itself we have cr reddy ralapalli anand krishna sharma vishwanath sachinarayana and marxist critics like ramchandra reddy velcheer narayan rao kv ramana reddy and formalist critics like rs sudarshanam and psychoanalyst critics and so many right now we have lots of feminist and dalit critics also so when we look at telugu literature from its entry into the indian literary scene we can see that it has proved its originality in all spheres of literature the translation of telugu has always been of very high standard when you talk about telugu literature it occupies a great part translation occupies a very important part of it because telugu translated all russian literature most of chinese literature and a lot of british literature into telugu and this has inspired telugu writers to write better also so telugu has brought the best literature of the world into their language and actually now what is happening on the telugu literary scene two things are mainly happening in telugu literary scene now one is exporting great telugu works to other areas through translation either to be were bringing other great works into telugu uh, so that we can get good exposure but right now we are taking our telugu works through translation to other languages so that other people can know what heritage telugu literature has what it can offer to the world in poetry prose and all genres and the second thing telugu is doing is as i said it's basically a lyrical language and it's easy on the ears and so it can reach a wider audience through audio literature so this is now being attempted so that many non resident telugus can also have the benefit of learning about telugu literature so telugu literature in an audio form is also one of the ways they are trying to promote telugu language and telugu literature and these two things translating exporting our own literature uh, through via english to other people and also through audio literature to people who can't speak or read telugu these are two ways of promoting telugu literature which is being done very effectively and literature in telugu is now continuing its journey of creativity scholarship versatility and social awareness so dear friends i think with this i'll conclude my lecture on telugu literature because this is only tip of the iceberg that is the only uh, comparison i can give for this particular lecture because there are so many things for each writer for each genre there are so many other people and other texts that can be mentioned and also can be debated on the whole telugu literature has a lot to offer to world literature and that is something a work on this area promoting telugu literature and letting it known to other people is one of the missions of most of the telugu seriously thinking researchers at now thank you very much for your patient listening